Okay, I call the May 8th uh, meeting of the school committee to order. Um, we do have one member joining us remotely tonight, so we'll do everything via roll call. So I will first uh, call for attendance. Chuck? Here. Tom? Here. Carla? Here. Sarah? Here. And Sean here. Um, Erin is ill tonight and won't be joining us. I think she may be watching at home, but she won't be joining us tonight. Um, so let me just do a quick walk through the agenda and then we will jump in. So we'll start with public comment for anything that's not on the agenda tonight. Um, we will move on to our consent agenda. We'll go through reports. In the new business section, we've got our friends from the Reading Education Foundation joining us tonight to give us an update on, on uh, grant activity from their organization. Um, Dr. Sison and uh, Ms. Wright will pr uh, provide an overview of special education student services, our sort of, you know, kind of annual year-end update on that. Um, we will then go into executive session for about 45 minutes uh, on two topics. One is um, both preparation for and uh, conducting, collective, uh, cl conducting contract negotiations um, with the superintendent, as well as um, discussing strategy with respect to collective bargaining for the RTA. Um, when we come out of executive session, depending on the results uh, of that, we uh, may take a vote on approving a successor contract for the superintendent. And then um, in the section of old business, uh, we do have a few minor changes to the, to the um, calendar for next school year, which we'll review and approve this evening. We'll have a discussion about school choice, and uh, depending on the um, sort of tenor of the, of the committee, uh, we may take a vote to opt out of school choice for next year or not. And then finally, um, we've got a number of earmarks that have been submitted on behalf of the schools, and we'll, we'll, take a, we'll have a quick discussion to review and vote to submit a letter of support to our delegation on Beacon Hill. So that's the agenda for this evening. Um, why don't we start with public comment? And again, this is for anything that's not on the agenda tonight. Yes, ma'am. I just have a few notes. If you could just tell us uh, your name and... Uh, My name is Alicia Gallagher, and I live at 36 Augustus Court in Reading. Great, thank you. Um, I say good evening to the members of the school committee and Superintendent Milicheski. Um, I'm a member of the, the St. Vincent de Paul Society um, at St. Agnes Church, and that's the reason that I'm here this evening. Um, it is our mission, as some of you know well, um, to serve the people who live in Reading in the time of their need. Our members call, call us and we help them pay their bills. Uh, we provide gift cards for food and gasoline. Through the mission of deeds, we find them furniture and household items and coupons to use in the St. Vincent de Paul store for, for clothing and just about anything you'd probably want to buy. Um, along with the things and the stuff, St. Vincent de Paul members also try to provide um, hope, caring, and give uh, people the sense that they're never alone um, because they're struggling terribly. Our neighbors call us and we um, answer them. For the past six summers, we have offered a supplemental food program to young families with children in the Reading School District. Um, these are children who are at risk of hunger during the summer when they don't have access to the meals they receive in school during the academic year. So for 10 weeks during the summer, we pack up bags and bags and bags of high quality nutritious foods each week and we deliver them to their, their homes. Um, this is accomplished with strict confidentiality as well. Each spring I have met with the superintendent to discuss the program, um, our continuing mission, um, some of the logistics and changes from year to year. Um, this year when I met with um, Dr. Milicheski, about the many families whom we are not serving. And this is a great concern to us because we know that we're, we're getting families um, that we provide services for all summer long. But we know there are many more out there who aren't being served. And this was my concern with Dr. Milicheski. And um, what he talked to me about was um, the people who are in the schools, who are the faculty, who are the guidance counselors, maybe the school nurse, maybe um, the principal for sure, and we've worked with some of your principals already, um, but they're on the front lines. They know uh, the children who are in need, um, and they know them well, and they know the parents, and they know the grandparents, and they're perfectly positioned we feel um, that um, because they, are, they have a trust and a bond with these children and actually with these families as well, 
that um, they might have the ab availability to um, get things started or propose to the families that they give us a call, that introduce them to the summer program. It's obviously absolutely free. It's totally funded. Um, and um, so we're asking, our ask to you is, um, sorry, I lost my place and I have to have my notes. Asking you if you will please consider telling them that they are most welcome to join the St. Vincent de Paul Summer Food Program. We would be so happy this summer to help them with their needs for food. And not just the food, but also the element of hope and caring and not ever letting them feel that they're alone because it's one of their biggest problems and the source of their great depression that they can't get out of anything because they're by themselves and we don't want them to feel that way. Um, and just a postscript, happy Teachers Appreciation Week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we make our children what they are as adults, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you for the work your organization does as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Carla. Oh, thank you, Ms. Gallagher. We appreciate it. Um, we, um, for me personally, St. Vincent de Paul is near and dear to my heart. My daughter worked um, at a homeless shelter, St. Vincent de Paul Homeless Shelter in Arizona last year. Um, she, Jesuit Volunteer Corps, and um, oh, and um, last week our Girl Scout troop um, is closing. Class of 2020 is closing their account, and we decided to write a check to you. So you either got it or we'll be getting it shortly. Thank you so much. Thank so, you so much. yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else from a public comment perspective for things that are not on the agenda? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we will move to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Chuck. Any discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing none. Okay. Uh, again, we'll do a roll call vote. Chuck? Yes. Tom? Yes. Carla? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And Sean, yes. Consent agenda carries five to zero. Okay, let's move on to reports. And Jada, we will start with you. Thank you. So as we are moving further into quarter four, we've been having a pretty dynamic time at the high school. There have been a lot of movement with the senior class as we're preparing to graduate and eventually leave Reading Public Schools, which has been kind of sad and at the same time exciting for many of us. We are currently in the second week of AP exams so that is kind of a stressful, energetic time in the school where everyone is kind of looking forward to ending their classes, move it for younger grades who are still taking AP classes, moving into projects. So we've been having a pretty momentous kind of end of the year celebration for the senior class. Um, we've been, we're moving into prom season and I think that many of us are kind of remembering the memories that we've gotten from, for many of us, 13 years within the school district, reaching out to teachers and people who have made an impact on our lives. 
Thank you. Um, you know, and your, your class has obviously had a, uh, a remarkable four years unlike any other class we'll ever experience. So um, all credit to, to you and your classmates for uh, making it through and getting to this point. And we're excited to, we're excited to be out there on graduation day. So. The last two years, yeah. All right. Um, so uh, Dr. Stice. Thank you, and I just want to say it's always such a pleasure to hear from our students, and, and you'll be definitely missed, as I always have a hard time following up your great reports. <laughs> so thank you for all the work you've done. Um, just very quickly, we um, had a um, presentation by Lynn Lyons scheduled, um, and we had to reschedule that due to um, a conflict for her and a family illness. So that will be coming up. But next Tuesday, May 16th, we, um, in conjunction with the Reading CPAC and Austin Prep, we're gonna be offering a movie showing of The Anxious Nation, which is Lynn Lyons' movie, and anybody is welcome. Um, so there's some information about that on the website. Also, um, hopefully people have heard, we have a new basketball team in Reading, a unified basketball team. Um, if you haven't had a chance to go see, they have a couple of games coming up. Um, tomorrow they're in Lexington, um, but on Thursday at four o'clock they'll be playing in RMHS. And then just um, some of the other little things um, our speaker alluded to, just that it's a teacher appreciation week. We also know it is nurses appreciation week, which I often am up here talking about nursing and how hard they work. And so um, as a central office staff, we just wanted to honor that and also the food service um, who we're also appreciating. Excellent. Um, Dr. Milicheski. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. So our first update, of course, Teacher Appreciation Week. I think one of the hallmarks of the Reading Public Schools is just some of the amazing educators that we have across our district. I think uh, probably everyone up here and in the audience can remember a lot of those educators who have impacted their lives in such special ways. I certainly feel that as an individual, as I look back on some of the educators who have shaped my life and experience and also as a parent and also just as a professional too, uh, we have some of the best educators here in the district. So if you get a couple of minutes, please, any little gesture of appreciation, while we encourage you to do that all the time, this is certainly a good time and a good reminder and a good little kick to make sure that you thank those who are impacting our children in such positive ways. A couple of things you can do, just a quick note first, we have REF here in the crowd, and this is not a plug because they're here, but this is because <laughs> I think a really good opportunity is one is the, uh, the staff tribute. So I put that in my uh, written newsletter this past week um, at readingef.org. You can look at how to do this in more detail. This is a way you can make a little bit of a donation that goes directly to uh, the PTOs and to the REF grants, which we'll hear about tonight, and helps recognize and celebrate a teacher. So that's a nice, thoughtful way to do that that also kind of multiplies in impact. Um, also, as always, just a quick thoughtful note to a teacher goes a long way. There's also something in our written newsletter last week that if you send a note to us in a little Google form, we will thank that teacher on behalf of us and CC you on that note too. That's just a way for us to be in the loop on some of the amazing work our teachers are doing as well. Uh, RCO team to try to celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week the best we can uh, is we are trying to cover as many teacher classes this week as we can. So whether that is stepping into teacher class, whether that's covering lunch duty, recess duty, story time, um, I think we're already signed up for 35 and I think there's a few more coming in. So it's a fun way for us to thank some of those teachers who are uh, just by giving them a little bit of an extra break. Uh, similar note about appreciating teachers, I uh, would also like to uh, give the community a heads up that we are going to uh, put out some information this week around the Distinguished Teacher Award. We did this for the first time last year. Uh, we had in a the uh, Dorothy and Arnold Berger Trust Fund, as you know, they left us some of money to be given out towards RPS exemplary teachers. So we'll be using those funds to ask the community, whether that's students, staff, families, for nominations of just some of those uh, staff members who best embody what it means to be an RPS educator, uh, and then we'll celebrate them and recognize them later this year. Um, we will have, last year we had Jamie Benger, uh, Christine Crocker, Ann Manna, Tim McIntyre, and Andy Spinelli as some of the recipients. We plan to recognize probably a similar number of, of teachers this year. We're also gonna expand the category to have a couple of uh, non sort of RTA members too, sort of any other bucket, whether it's secretary, custodial staff, uh, food service worker, cafeteria workers, whatever sort of other members of our RPS system that are making an impact. So more information to come on that and we look forward to celebrating some of our great teachers. 
Uh, I'd like to give a couple of personnel updates. These are some of the searches that we've been talking about publicly over the past couple of months. Uh, as we know, the, we had one open AP position that was at JE after we filled all of our ele other elementary AP positions. Would like to share that JE is thrilled that uh, they just recently named uh, Jessica Swindell as the next AP. Jessica is currently a AP in the Danvers Public Schools dual role, the teach classroom teacher and AP role, and has been a classroom teacher for 13 years in grades one, two, and four. Parker Middle School also just completed their assistant principal search, uh, just named Dr. Jill Story as the assistant principal. Uh, Dr. Story is currently an assistant principal at Medford High School. Prior to that, she was the uh, grade seven through 12 uh, social studies department chair in Maskinomic Public Schools and has 21 years of classroom teaching experience. So welcome to both uh, Jill and Jessica. We think they'll be phenomenal additions to our district. A Couple of uh, ongoing searches, uh, the RISE director search. As the committee knows, we did separate that role this year from having a, uh, it used to be the combined role of team chair and director role. Those roles are now separate. Uh, we thank Joanne King, Dr. Joanne King again for stepping in the interim role this year. We have two finalists right now who are still going through the process. Both finalists met with staff last week, did a site visit and are continuing on in the process. Hopefully more information to share either the end of this week or early next week. Next search, our director of finance and operations search. Um, we have four um, candidates coming in for interviews this week with our screening committee and look forward to moving that process forward pretty quickly over the next two weeks. And then last but not least, we uh, our K-8 to STEM coordinator uh, posting. We moved through an interview process, did not feel like we found the right fit, uh, so we are reposting that position. It was posted before as a K-8 STEM coordinator. We think we attracted a lot of candidates with more of the technology side, which is exciting. Uh, but given that we sort of already explored that pool, we are now posting as a K-8 math and science uh, curriculum coordinator, seeing if we maybe attract some different candidates and uh, we'll move that process forward over the next couple of weeks. Um, last update on my end too is I know we've shared with the community we're in the process of writing a multi-year district strategic plan. Uh, we are uh, almost ready to move that forward to gather community input and feedback. We'll be sharing ways that the community can give feedback over the next couple weeks and still plan to present that to the school committee for approval uh, in the middle and end of June. So that's all on my end. Great. Uh, okay, so we'll move to committee reports. I will start with Chuck. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, the recreation committee met uh, the, I guess the week before town, yeah, the week before town meeting and the main topic at that meeting was the discussion of the warrant article uh, for Birch Meadow, which uh, ended up passing uh, at town meeting. Uh, so we were happy about that because there was quite a bit of delta in the, uh, in the ask versus uh, the ARPA money that was received. So based on costs that came in for the for the project, but uh, town meeting uh, overwhelmingly supported, which was great news, because uh, that that's project has been lingering around forever, so it's good to get it going. Uh, the SWEC committee met uh, last week uh, for that, the Simons Way Exploratory Committee, and what we did at that meeting is we I think I mentioned to this committee last time we we had some uh, voting issues with open meeting law, so we re re revisited all of those, and uh, we've instructed the chair to go back to the select board to uh, expand the scope of the committee, which right now the scope is just looking at that little piece of land that that I think it's five acres that the uh, town meeting purchase from Zani a, a few years ago uh, to expand the whole, just look at the whole footprint down there. And the, I was really a proponent of that because after looking at all the surveys that came back, uh, it was clear that a lot of the things that, that peop, community members wanted us to do uh, really couldn't happen in that in that space, so uh, it was good to look at the whole thing and see whether we can uh, try to satisfy some of those those requests uh, by looking at the whole footprint down there. So it's I'm sensing that they'll probably we were supposed to sunset this summer. I'm sensing that that committee is probably going to go a little bit longer. Uh, so we also uh, at that meeting discussed and. 
RFI, which is, uh, uh, R, excuse me, RIF, which is request for uh, imp information, information uh, about what potentially people would do, want to do down there. We decided not to move forward with, with that because uh, we want to see what, what the select board agrees our scope is first before we, we do that. And we also talked about uh, putting a member of the Reading Ice uh, Arena on the committee and we just didn't feel like it made sense to do that. They can certainly come to as an abutter to our meetings, uh, but they, just because they'd be singularly focused, it didn't make sense to put them as a voting member on the committee. So, and there's a recreation committee meeting tonight, which I'm not at, but I'll report on that. Thanks, Chuck. Can I ask one? Oh, yeah, please. But, um, the spine, is that starting immediately? I'm sorry? The, the, the Birch Meadow? I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, right? the, the, yeah. yeah, the, uh, you know, the, the uh, RFP all came back. So, yeah, they're ready to go. It's shovel ready. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think it's as soon as the spring, as soon as, yeah. as, soon as the spring seasons over. wrap up. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was going to overlap with it. That's no, why. No, it was specifically asked and answered during time meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and it was going to impact yep. a softball. No. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tom. Okay, a um, couple things. Um, so I'll keep on the trend of town meeting, and it does sort of dovetail to some other things, but um, most of the p people here know, but the audience may not know, and um, the Special Education Reserve Fund was passed by town meeting, um, so that should be able to be established pretty soon. Uh, we, as a policy subcommittee, will be taking that up um, shortly uh, as a result. Um, aligned with the same thing, uh, by law 4.2, which required physicals for all new hires, uh, was changed to agree to be changed by town meeting as well. So that means the policy subcommittee can repick up GCFE, G GDFE, um, and m amend it to align with the new policy recommendation as well. Thanks to um, Michelle for raising that as an issue, and we worked it through and got that done. Um, so that was good, and we're thankful that town meeting supported those things. Um, Moving on and with policy related items, um, on our meeting on the 13th of April, the three of us, uh, among many other policies, reviewed and approved six policies, uh, GCJ, DGA, DH, DI, DJ, and DJA. Don't, don't do it. <laughs> right? Um, for um, this body to review and hopefully accept, um, as the case may be. Uh, that, if we approve those six, that will put us up to 28 that we've done this year already. Um, there are four more that are being discussed tomorrow, uh, five more being discussed tomorrow here in the library conference room. Uh, we're meeting with some of the students, um, both our, our SAC uh, as well as the uh, SOCA for EJI team to go through FF um, and the discussion around that. But also we have uh, four more D policies to review as well, one of which would be for revocation. Um, so we've been a little bit busy. Um, in addition to that, we reviewed kind of first drafts of new policies, um, which are geared towards suspension, expulsion, and discipline um, policies. You may remember a previous report where we had a disconnect between JIC and JK and what MASC was doing versus what the best recommended processes were, um, and we've essentially decided to break JK into four policies, JK, JKD, JKE, and JKF. Um, and those are pretty meaty policies, so they'll take two reviews, three of them will be two reviews because they're brand new. JK would be a single review, um, but in concert with JKD and ENF. Um, so that probably will be June, July by the time we're done with it, um, but there's a lot that's going on in that space. Um, so that's the policy subcommittee meeting. Um, and then legal counsel. We um, have met multiple times as a legal counsel subcommittee. Um, we created a um, invitation letter. We called down uh, from the Council of School Attorneys website from MASC um, and sent an, a letter of invitation to 14 um, legal law firms across the state for our student services position, uh, inclusive of our existing um, support that we have, our legal counsel. We received seven um, responses back uh, to that invitation, so we will be interviewing 
Um, six of them, the seventh is our existing council. Uh, we don't feel a need to interview them because we know them, but they are st still possibilities for finalists as necessary. So six additional law firms will be interviewing um, next week, um, and then we'll make a decision of which three to four will come to the final round, which we'll interview in, in early June in order to make our final recommendation to this body for the last meeting, which I think is on the 22nd of Correct. June. So we've been busy little bees. Indeed. Tom, two questions on the policies. Um, so the, the, the six that you listed that were approved by the policy subcommittee, those are all updates? All updates. Okay, so let the service notice that those six policies um, will appear for a one meeting review, uh, likely at our meeting on the 25th of this month, um, but we'll get the updated policies to everyone in advance as, as our policy on policy adoption requires, my yeah. favorite policy, the policy on policy adoption. I thought you didn't want to do it at that meeting. You wanted to do it in the June meeting. Uh, we'll see how the agenda shakes out, okay. um, but maybe as soon as the 25th. Um, and then um, the other question that I had for you was, I lost it, so never mind. Related um, to the bylaws or related to special education? No, oh, is there a um, is there a, uh, an MASC model policy for the Reserve fund. There's not. Okay. There's not. So okay. we'd be creating it probably under the grants and mm. fund <coughs> subcategory. We'd create our own essentially under there. Okay. Thank you. Um, Carla. Thank you. Um, so the Killam Building Committee um, met, and on May 3rd, we received the request for um, services from the OPMs, from the owners, project managers. Uh, we received six bidders. Um, we have a week to review them, so the whole committee will review all six. We have a, um, a ranking system, so we'll have a short list by the 15th. Um, and we're going to set up a, a subcommittee to do the interviews. We'll come back to the committee to approve it um, because the, the committee has the actual approval on it. Um, and if all goes well, it'll go to MSBA for review and approval on June 14th. And then by mid-August, we will hopefully have an owner's project manager on staff. That's when the fun begins. <laughs> and there's a um, Board of Library Trustees meeting tonight, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, enough said on that one. Yeah. Okay, uh, <laughs> Sarah. Nothing out of Carla. Okay, and then I'll just add one, one additional comment about town meeting. So um, our uh, school committee recommended budget um, was approved by town meeting with, with relatively little discussion, which I'll credit to Dr. Milicheski and Ms. Baton and the team for, as usual, some outstanding preparation and delivery um, of that message. Um, so we're grateful to all the town meeting members for approving that budget and allowing us to move forward with all of the important priorities that we've got baked into it. So thank you for that. Go ahead. I said one more thing I forgot to thank some members of our community too. So I, we had a teacher uh, earlier this year say, I have a great idea, it would be awesome if members of our administration, central office staff, who don't spend time in our classroom on a daily basis, plus any of our town elected officials, town leaders, would spend a day in our school. So on April 26th, uh, we had many members of our community step into our classroom. So I'd just like to thank our school committee, uh, two select board members, Karen Herrick, Jackie McCarthy, our town manager, our fire chief, and our FinCom chair, all who spent days in our classrooms too. So I just think that that's taking a day off of work to be able to do that, I think is uh, just a testament to sort of so many members of our community all in our school. So thank you to all who did that, and thank you to Heather Murphy for her wonderful idea, and congratulations, Heather got to have me in her class all day, but I had a lot of fun in fourth grade for the day. So thank you um, for everyone, though, for jumping in, and we want to continue to do that next year. Okay. Uh, and with that, we are two minutes ahead of schedule, and we will move to our friends from the Reading Education Foundation. So I, it was pointed out, I forgot, um, the, the podium doesn't pick up well at home on Zoom, so I wonder if we could all crowd around up here uh, at the table with Jada, and we'll kind of figure it out. We'll do some uh, microphone shuffling as well. Or we could probably do like two and two. Rather than trying to crowd five seats into one table. Just make sure table. that you can do the mic will be what the Zoom will hear. So they need to make sure. You can just turn them around. Yeah, why don't we, do you want to come over here or stay yeah. on that side? Can I, sit, can I come yeah, on this side? Yep, oh. Absolutely, come over here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it over here. <laughs> you can get
get accustomed to it, huh, Laura? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stay standing. Okay, so, first of all, thank you very much for allowing us to be here. I'm Laura O'Neill. I am the president of the Reading Education Foundation. I'm joined here by Debbie Hattery, Andrea Nelson, and Ann Cruikshank. They're four of our board members. We have our check here for $42,478, which represents the grants that we are submitting this year. So I'd just like to give you a short overview of REF and how we get this money. Um, our mission is to support innovation and excellence in the classroom, and we do that by asking the teachers and the staff to submit a grant for what they want funded. And we refer to that as teacher-initiated grants. And we raise the money for those grants by undertaking the Festival of Trees. Uh, and consistent with our mission, we've expanded the Festival of Trees over the years. It has now become a large, beloved community event. We have performers, we have food trucks, we have entertainers, and we have a large staff of student volunteers, Teachers come through, administrators come through, school committee members come through. It's a family event, it's a town event, and it raises so much money that goes right back into the schools. So we're very happy with our fundraising model. The other fundraiser was mentioned um, and dovetails with Teacher Appreciation Week and their teacher staff tributes. And what's great about them is that um, the front side of the tribute just has the name, and the back side, which is um, usually people don't see, is the personal message to the teacher. So teachers get to show that they were recognized, but the student's personal note is just for the teacher's eyes. So it's great. If you look on our website, you can see all the teachers who were recognized last year, and we'll do the same. We just recount all the names, and it also includes staff, which it's been great to see them recognize so many, so many people in the building. Um, and we take 30% of that, goes right to the PTO of the honorees. And we do that so that um, the PTOs help spread the word, and also it's just another way for us to contribute to the PTO. The rest of the money goes back into our grants and gets back into the schools. Um, and the last way we get money is by direct donations, and we have some very generous people here in Reading, businesses and individuals, so we also thank them for that, their support. And presently, we are looking for volunteers. We want to continue this work. We think we have a great model. We've all been working at it for a long time, and we'd love to have new people involved. Um, so if anyone, or you know of anyone interested, please direct them to us. We'd be happy to um, show them more about REF. So, any questions? Do you still do the silent auction or the, you know, the, the online auction? Or? We have abandoned that. <laughs> Festival has become so successful <laughs> that we can limit our fundraising. I'm going to ask another fundraising question. When are you going to bring back bingo? <laughs> well, everyone in the community does it now. Yeah. So. That was part of our innovation. That's yeah. our model. We started, people that replicated. Was phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> it was the last last thing right before COVID. Yeah, COVID. And mm -hmm. I think yeah. you won that night. Too. I did win that <laughs> night, yes. <laughs> That's why you wanted to come back. That's why I wanted to come yeah. back, yeah. What percentage of your, um, the money that you raise comes from direct donation and what comes from fundraisers? So roughly 80% is Festival of Trees, 10% is teacher tributes, 5% <laughs> is probably direct donation, and the rest is probably businesses. More questions? Sure. Are there any particular grants that you're giving this year that really jump out to you as something that's really exciting? I'm, they're, all, they're all awesome, right? So I don't, I, I don't want to minimize any of them with this answer necessarily, but if there's one, that, one or two that you think are really innovative, cool, interesting, find the word. What was interesting from my perspective, and Debbie was on the grants committee and I wasn't, so I'll also let her give her answer. Um, two, from both the high school and the middle school, we got podcast grants. Mm, grants related, oh, grants yeah. related to setting up podcasts. And I thought that was so interesting that um, the teacher, you know, this, the teachers all have the same ideas without communicating it. And one thing we like about REF is we can start something at a lower grade and then it continues on with the student. And 
it's again part of our mission to see these teachers think of things and it was great to have them come up with that. Mm -hmm. We're also doing something large scale all the, um, with the art curriculum. Mm -hmm. I think we also like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No, the art one was mine. Yeah. <laughs> like the one. podcasts are great. Just that it touches students from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. So our grants have wide re reaching access and deep access in terms of curriculum and arts and PE even. Yep. And just all sorts of great innovative programs that then hopefully can be piloted if it works well at the small level. Great. Go ahead, Carl. So the, the one I noticed um, was the audiobook collection in elementary schools. And then it started me thinking, our elementary libraries don't have audiobooks, do they? They do have some. Do they, they have recently? some. <laughs> and in fact, two years ago, we gave them some <laughs> to start the program. But when you put something in each school, as you guys know full well, it's not that many. It's five books, so we were happy to do it again. I also think it helps um, reach a lot more kids who may not be able to mm -hmm. access Absolutely. the reading otherwise without having an audio book paired with mm -hmm. um, the actual book they're holding in their hands. So we felt like we were reaching a much wider audience yep. and providing uh, even more books to them. I love that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll just say thank you, I mean, for all the work that you do. Festival of Trees is awesome, but obviously the reason you're raising all the money is, is, is even better. Um, for those watching at home, in our packet tonight is a, is a, a listing of the, of the grants. There's nine distinct grants. Every school is impacted. Um, so uh, we just really appreciate all the work that you all do and, and um, the, the generous grants that come out as a result. And I happen to be married to a PTO president. I know she's very appreciative as well. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll just express her. Her gratitude as well so thank you very much great thank you, thank you. and if we could just take one photo with, this, with the check and school yeah. committee that'd be fantastic are you sure you don't want to be in it all right thank you jada you want to slide over to the front i don't to shy away from the Oh. <laughs> I, I attended last year yeah. to the. Uh, I was hoping I would have. I know I'm Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm a double major biochem poli sci. That's quite a combination. Mm -hmm. I want to write health policy. Ah, okay. Biochem and poli sci. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, so with that, we will move to our next order of business, which is our special education student services update. Um, Ms. Wright's already made her way up here, so that's perfect. Uh, Dr. Stice, Ms. Wright, I'll hand it to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very glad to be here and uh, be able to share an update with everybody um, about the work we've been doing this year. You're going to hear an overview of a lot of multifaceted work. Um, there isn't a lot of clear through lines. There are lots of buckets and themes. Um, a lot of what you're going to be hearing about was rooted in our strategic plan around sense of belonging. And we've been doing that data collection work this year, deciding what is the impact and then how do we go from there. And we're really looking at our data, refining to help us make decisions to move forward. You're obviously going to hear a lot about compliance because that is one of the core components of special education and also the TFM, um, which is our tiered focus monitoring for our compliance. 
Um, and some of the other themes you're just gonna hear throughout this process are about all students and thinking about all students as general ed students first, working together for a continuous cycle of improvement, using our assessment data to ensure that students are making progress, and of course, family engagement matters. So as Jen just mentioned, there are a lot of factors that drive the work that we do, and I'm just gonna go over a few of those things. Some of the, these are just a few of the things that drive the work we do. We are always looking at the least restrictive environment for our students, and this is one of the things that the state is really focusing on that we really always need to be looking at presuming um, competence for our students. Inclusion, we're always looking for those meaningful inclusionary opportunities for our students and the students. They are the most important, so mm -hmm. always need to be thinking about them. The IEP, as Jen mentioned, compliance is a lot of the work that we're doing, and not only thinking about the compliance with the IEPs, but we're thinking about, um, and we'll be talking about that a little bit later in the presentation, about the new IEP process that, that we'll be rolling out through the state. Capacity. We're always looking at our student, our teachers' capacity and the professional development that we can continue to provide to our teachers so we're meeting all the, the um, needs of all of the students in the district. Data collection. Data collection is driving everything that we do in special education. Believe. We sh believe strongly in our students, our families, and the work that our teachers are doing with all of our students. Community. We're very excited about the work that we've been doing with the community and those growing relationships with our community partners. Yeah. State regulations, again, kind of speaks for itself, but um, a lot of the work that we do is around those regulations, ensuring that we're complying with them. And we'll talk a little bit more about the TFM or tiered focus monitoring um, that we completed this year. That's looking at um, our compliance with those regulations. That one says teamwork. 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 <laughs> we can't do this alone. <laughs> and thank you for helping me, part of the team. <laughs> Instruction, we're really excited about all the work that we're doing, um, partnering and collaborating with the, the learning and teaching department as well as um, student services. inspired we're um we're inspired by our students every day and that's a huge driving factor of the work we do assessment we're looking at the assessments that we do and making sure that we are using the most current um, research-based assessment tools when we're working um, assessing our student needs and again all means all we believe it and we're saying it every day so as we think about um, our strategic plan from last year, our first strategic, strategic objective was that safe and supportive learning environment. And we wrote this statement together and we, it anchors our work. We're constantly revisiting it, making sure we are really truly living it and we are asking each other all the time, are our students seen, valued, affirmed, and connected? And it's really the driving force of our work. As we go through the next slides, a lot of them are just for your information because our work is rooted in research, but we wanna highlight a couple of areas for you. So as you look at the next few slides, they're really for your, re um, your reference, um, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but it's really important that we remember that um, all of the social, emotional, and cognitive processes are so intertwined, and if students aren't feeling safe, valued, seen, and heard in school, that it's going to have an impact on their ability to make progress. At the bottom of each of these research slides, you'll see a, um, a link to the article that it came from if people want to go um, deeper into depth around some of what this research says. 
but essentially what we know is that we really need to respect each student's identity, affirm their capacity to succeed, and really recognize each student for their contributions and agency that they have within the school environment and within the community itself. So one of the things that we did as a, as a district was we committed to trying to get some data to really see where we were around sense of belonging. So we um, are using the Panorama data system to collect some data and we did um, two sets of data collection, one for our third through fifth graders and then one through our sixth through 12th graders. And we asked a series of questions um, uh, that were um, multiple choice. And when we get that data, we know that it's not the full picture, it's just a piece of the data, but it started to drive our work. So in the fall, when we gave this to our grades three to five, we had uh, 856 students who participated, and 79% of them reported having a good feeling of sense of belonging in school. And so when you look at the same data for the same period of this fall, we had um, 1,450 students take it from sixth to 12th grade and they reported a 55% sense of belonging rate, feeling like that made sense for them and they had five, quest five questions. So that's all well and good, but it doesn't really help us dig into what does this mean. So we started comparing the data to the national databases of everybody who's taken the Panorama survey. Um, but I want you to know we also went right down to the student level. So we're looking at the national data, which I'll show you on the next few slides, but then literally the schools were kid by kid going through who's struggling, how do we help them, what does this mean, what else do we need to do? So when you look at the sense of belonging data for our elementary school students, you can see compared to the national data, we're doing pretty well, but we're not doing well enough for the students that are on the other side of that slide. We still have students that we need to reach. And when you go to the middle schools, you'll see that Again, compared to other middle schools across the nation, our students are saying they, they feel a sense of belonging um, greater than average of other schools, still not where we want it to be, not where we are talking about one student at a time and making sure they are successful. And then our overall sense of belonging score for the high school was 48%. We have a little bit of more work to do there. Um, and um, we are continuing to look at that. The other thing we did then was starting to take this data and compare it to data we had. We needed other data points. So on this slide, one of the things that you'll see is we've been really working on our attendance. We've been collecting data on it, we've collect, uh, created dashboards, and people are really working very hard to make sure that our students are coming to school. The little black line is the standard deviation. So this pretty much is what we could have predicted, that the students who are feeling a lack of sense of belonging at elementary school, it's not super related to their attendance because that's more adult driven at the elementary school level. But when you get to the middle and high school level, our students that are struggling with sense of belonging are also our students that are struggling with attendance. And this is where what do we do with this data starts to really matter. Our high school and middle schools and some of our elementary schools are doing re-engagement plans with students that have had great success at the high school bringing them in, making a plan of how they're gonna come back, having everybody sign off on it, and really rebuilding relationships and, and bringing people forward. That still wasn't enough for us. This is hard data, yep. Do we have any idea where this compares to data pre-pandemic and if this is mostly a shift due to COVID and like mm. kind of an unmooring that many people feel from like their community? based on? That is an amazing question and unfortunately we don't have that data. This is the first year we're collecting it. We're going to do it again in the spring, see if we've made a difference. 
and all of these systems we're putting in place are gonna hopefully take us forward. So definitely a missing piece, so perfect question. So we're gonna build from there. Yep. Just building on Jada's question, if we don't have it for our data, from the national data perspective, is there a trend that we're seeing that it's dropped down? So can we look at that data for that period? We don't have it for us, but is there something we can do? Have you done that already? Absolutely. Uh, essentially, we're we're seeing across the nation increase in lack of sense of belonging, increase in crisis data, and increase in um, chronic absenteeism. It's across the state and across the nation. A lot of things are being linked to the pandemic. So, which will actually, I'll show you a slide um, in a little bit talking uh, about our crisis data and how that relates as well. Um, so we didn't wanna just use um, numbers around, you know, give us a rating, because that doesn't tell the whole story. So we really wanted to have some qualitative data as well. And at the um, elementary level, we use their open response questions and then really wanted to hear more what the students had to say and have some deeper conversations with them at the classroom level. And there really were three themes that came across all of our th uh, third through fifth graders. One was that the longer the students are in a school, the more sense of belonging they had. I can't tell you the number of times I read, I'm a J.E. Jaguar or I'm a Killam Koala. They, they own that and believe where they're from and that helped create a sense of belonging. Um, and we see that in Reading all the time. I can't tell you the number of adults who say, I'm a Reading Rocket <laughs> and I went to this school and that school and that school. That's an amazing piece about Reading and we're seeing that with our students. Some of the things that we, we heard were that students really want to feel like they're not alone. And this was um, really heartbreaking for our staff to kind of dig into some of the examples our students gave to us over and over again. Students who said, I feel like I'm the only student in my class that doesn't celebrate Christmas, so I pretend I do. They don't know if they are or they aren't, but if everybody's pretending, we're not celebrating that, that diversity. And also they mentioned a lot about if I don't have anybody to play with at recess, I'm alone. And what are we doing about that as a district, as a at the classroom level and at the individual student level? The other piece about diversity, we, we've committed as a district to really celebrate diversity. And our kids are saying, they feel like they get judged for either looking different or maybe having different food. So they often won't, are you shaking your head yes? In, I went to Dray and I had a kid who was eating um, Indian food in my class and people like would not sit near them. It was heartbreaking. Yeah. Like, looking back now. And I think that's exactly what our students are reporting, that they are feeling that. So what are we gonna do about it as a district? Because you shouldn't not have someone sitting next to you just because of the food you choose to eat. Um, so that's really something we wanna work on. We did a little bit differently at the middle and high school level. So for our grades six to 12, we use something called the empathy interview process to really get the student stories. We work with um, Joseph Longbottom, who was our leadership fellow, and he trained our guidance counselors and social workers in using a protocol from the Stanford Design School. And we interviewed four groups of students, 17 students in all. Um, and we really tried to handpick some of our students who we felt like maybe didn't have a voice. So students, uh, some of our Boston residents, students, students on IEPs, students who were taking um, high academic level classes, but were not reported as being engaged in school or had frequent absenteeism. And we went through this protocol with them. Um, and what you'll see in our, our next strategic plan is actually a lot of those suggestions are now embedded in our work as we dive in deeper and go forward. So the findings of the, that summary um, 
are listed here as our qualitative data, and I have to tell you, the staff love this process so much, they um, want to do it in other areas. They were very excited, especially the guidance counselors, really felt like this was a great way to have conversations with students that was structured but free flowing to allow them to express their ideas. Um, and we really want to be able to do that in other areas and have more data collection systems because what the students told us was really clear across all the subgroups. They want connections to, their adult, um, to the adults and peers in their school and they don't feel like they have those connections. They also really want to have agency over their learning environment. They want to have choice about what they're doing, how they're demonstrating their knowledge, what, how their classroom is engaged and set up. I am so happy you are sitting across from me because I'm watching you shake your head. <laughs> I can give you an example of a lot of people like taking AP Biology at the high school because the teacher that teaches it, uh, Mr. Albright, allows students to pick the type of assignment, like they have categories of assignments that they get to choose from what they want to do so that they're able to kind of learn in their own way and it makes the class more popular. Yeah, that's an excellent example and something we've heard time and time again from our students, so thank you. Um, the other thing people really wanted um, was they want opportunities to go deeper into some of our diversity. They specifically said, are we really looking at Black History Month or different languages or other academic offerings that celebrate diversity? And are we purposeful about that? Because they, weren't feel, they were feeling it was more of a cursory look at things versus an in-depth, we value this difference. Um, that's what we heard from the students. So, um, Part of what you were asking, uh, Mr. Wise, about the pre-pandemic data is if we look at our crisis data from uh, last year and this year, it aligns with our sense of belonging work in the sense that we are seeing students who are really struggling. Um, we've had 145 reported incidences this year that we would consider critical incidents the majority of them around suicidal thoughts, self-harm, harassment, and hospitalizations. And I can tell you, although we don't have the pre-pandemic data, it was not as high as it is now, for sure, um, just going by the old bills. But last year, in total, the whole year, we had 13 students that were hospitalized. As of um, last week, we had 18. Um, and we know there's gonna be more. So. We are seeing students who are struggling and now we really need to continue to build those systems of how are we gonna support them and what are we gonna do to make sure that they're able to engage in school. Um, how is this data collected? Because could this also be like kind of showing an improvement in how we collect data as well? Because I mean, you are like my plant and I need you to come to every presentation I do. You're exactly right. Um, it's actually funny, Dr. Melicheski just asked me tonight on the way up here, what did you used to do um, before you were working on all these systems? And that is exactly a huge piece of, of the work I'm doing right now is developing systems to look at discipline, crisis, attendance, and not only having the systems to collect the data, but what are we meaningfully doing with that? And so um, that is something that has been a huge body of work over the past couple of years. Um, so you're right, we didn't have this data before because we weren't necessarily collecting it in a meaningful way. I just mean also more as like mental health becomes destigmatized, people may be more willing to be truthful about what is going on and that could increase the number of reported cases even though it's not the, an increase in the actual number of cases? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I think we're, we're really starting to see um, more families and students asking for help versus we're just not gonna be in school and how all of that dovetails. So um, we've, we've done a lot of work and you'll hear a little bit later around building systems of support for people. So as they feel comfortable disclosing what's going on, we have the resources to support them. 
Yeah, you make an, a really good point too as you think about it. It would be easy sometimes to say our goal was to decrease the number of reported incidents as a way to say maybe that's a sign that we're making progress. But actually I think what you, you, you're you hitting at here too is sometimes we feel like now we may be uncovering more things because we have better systems to like intervene early or that we, some of our students are feeling more comfortable self-reporting things or some of our families have better mechanisms to reach out to staff to express concerns. So I don't think we can make a you know the connection between a decrease in reported inter crisis incidents is an, is a is a positive sign necessarily. Uh, what we are trying to make sure we're getting better at is finding ways that we can identify students who need additional support and then being more consistent in our responses too. And I think that that's part of what Dr. Stey and her team are doing is saying when we have X Y Z happen, we need to make sure that across the system that there's consistently the same sort of interventions and supports provided. So um, I think you raise a really good point. And I think something we've talked as a leadership team, although we'd love to be able to stand up here next year and report, we are seeing a, a decrease in all of these incidences. That's really not what we're predicting based on the research and national trends. What we need to be able to say is we have a response that is thoughtful and caring and really quick and supportive so we can get kids back on track. Um, so as we think about some of our next steps, we're really trying to focus on fostering um, our positive relationships, increasing access to opportunities and really removing barriers, doing more professional learning, which so much um, dovetails with all the work that Sarah Hardy and her team are doing, and of course examining our policies and practices um, as we go forward. So the next slide really just shows you um, some more quotes on the research of the importance of all of this, and it's really embedded in the strategic plan. So when we go back and we look at the strategic plan from last year, this is the objective that you saw at the beginning that we wrote together at the beginning of that year and really wordsmithed it and, and worked on believing it. And then we wrote a few indicators um, underneath. And what we've learned for next year's plan is we should number these so that it's easier to refer to them. Um, so you'll, that's a little coming soon. In our next plan, they'll be numbered. Um, but as I go in more in depth into the next um, few slides, we just wanted to highlight some of the work. So this building a shared understanding of sense of belonging I just spent all those slides talking about the work we're doing, but two other pieces to that is we do have two district-wide teams per, um, participating in the Sense of Belonging Network um, with the state, which has been amazing. They actually helped us kind of talk through how do we do focus groups, what's another area of data collection, um, and we taught, were able to talk to other districts that were using Panorama and how were they using it. And then next year, we're actually gonna be able to have a, an additional team work with the state and really focus on um, what are best practices and picking um, the SEL curriculum that's gonna be more in line and, um, and consistent vertically. The next area that was in the plan was really to talk about our practice, our systems, our staffing models to focus on inclusive environments. So we've been doing lots of things. I just wanted to highlight um, a couple just to show some of the depth of the work we're doing. Um, for example, Project Wayfinder made it into the budget so that we have a system at the high school to address those social emotional pieces, which is huge and shows how the school committee and the district are really working together with the support of the town. Um, the work on the district handbook um, has um, really been an ongoing process, but it is very, very important and really goes back to all of those policy updates um, and all the letters Mr. Wise was citing at the beginning, making sure they're connected and people understand and what things are and we're giving appropriate notice. Um, and we're also working on creating not only the continuity of a district handbook, but an athletic handbook and then a handbook for all extracurricular activities. So everyone understands exactly what's gonna happen. Paired with that, we're really talking about doing meetings at the beginning of every season to say here are our expectations, this is what it looks like, does anyone have any questions 
um, for students and parents to really make this more of a living document than a checkbox. Um, Mary Giuliana and Catherine Frenzetti have been um, running a committee to look at our health and wellness policy, um, and they have done an amazing job. Um, I've participated in more conversations about bake sales and all of that because they're really diving into what makes sense for our students and how do we make sure they're safe, which is amazing work. Um, as I've mentioned before, we've been really doing a ton of work on our attendance protocols and creating dashboards that we can review at the district level, that the schools can review, and then have an impact on the student level. And I just want to share a bit of data about that. When you go onto the state's website, um, our attendance rate last March was 94.4%. Uh, this year it's 94.6%. So we're getting a little bit better. Where it really comes down to the students, chronic absenteeism, 10% or more last year was 15.3. Um, it's now down to 14.4. That's between 25 and 35 students who are no longer missing 10% of the school year. And when we look at that, about 20% absent rate Last year it was 2.8, now it's down to two. We're back to 25 to 30 students are now no longer in that category. So again, all means all, we're looking at them one at a time, we're making phone calls, we're doing home visits, and we're really connected to the town and we're starting to see it pay off. Um, another um, system that we've been working on is we've updated and refined our field trip protocols. We have a much more extensive field trip um, form now that is signed off by the school nurse, the principal, myself, Sarah Hardy, Mary Juliana, and then the superintendent if it's an international trip it obviously comes to you all. Um, but it really helps us to um, ensure the safety and compliance that every student is allowed to go, that if a student has a medical issue and needs a nurse, that we've thought about the transportation so that we really truly are inclusive and it now gives us data to say we've had 63 field trips thus far. And um, once school is over, we are gonna sit down and analyze what types of field trips, where are they coming from, are these equitable opportunities for all of our students. The other, um, one of the other indicators was around reviewing and implementing our practices, systems, and staffing models. Um, we are so grateful for the people that we work with. We've hosted community meetings and out of those community meetings, John at the YMCA has done an amazing job to um, offer adaptive swim lessons. That was something that our families had asked for. We were able to work towards, um, which is very, very exciting. We really have been partnering with our CPAC to have events and inclusive activities. Um, the new resident open house is just such an amazing thing for me. The town offers it every year and they were so great at partnering with us when we said we actually need to do translations and invite people in their native language and they had people who spoke a language other than English for the first time um, at the new town, uh, new resident open house. Um, some of the other things we've been doing as we are working with our CPAC and really thinking about who are our underserved populations, we've been developing a lot of resources um, for our homeless families. And as we heard from our speaker earlier tonight, there's definitely a need in this community. And we're really trying to make sure when you come in, if you need something, we can help you get what you need. Um, which has been exciting work. And we've also, to that end, hosted a community resource fair for families, which was super exciting. And to see the people from the library and everybody else there joining us was, was awesome. Um, underneath that bullet, you'll see like a little box that says transportation. This is my plug. We're having more and more families move to Reading that do not have access to transportation, especially our families who primary language is other than English. And we need to figure out a way to help get those children to school 
and for their families to be able to get to school, to join us for projects, to be able to do things. So we um, know we have a very um, thoughtful, inventive, inclusive community, and if anyone has any ideas on how to help us with that, um, we're continuing to work with Sudesna at the library around this, but if anyone has other ideas or partnerships, that's something we're still struggling with to make sure we have access to. Yeah? So don't we have a bus? Don't we have a bus, right? That white. Oh, the little van? Right, yes. The little van. Um, and I just thought of um, the um, senior center has one driver, but they're supposed to be hiring another full-time uh, driver. All right. And going to school in the morning, do they, are they need it at the senior center that early in the morning? That's excellent. I don't know. There's two buses there, too. Yeah, they have buses there, too. Great, Great. And those are the kind of ideas we're looking for to figure out how else can we partner to help these families. So we'll definitely reach out to them. I also think that that might be an issue, like, kind of beyond families without transportation. I mean, I, my mother is a single parent, so before November when I got my license, I was walking two miles home every day. And that could also be co contributing to absenteeism where I didn't really want to walk home when there was a foot of snow on the ground. It's two miles to my house from here. And it's, there are bus options available, but they're not really as accessible to most students, especially if they play sports, right? Yeah. So I think that could be an issue that could be looked at a lot more. Thank you, point well taken. I think that is definitely something um, we'll continue to work on. And if you have ideas or can think of some of those groups, let me know because um, we really wanna make sure people feel like they don't have to walk home you know, through a snowstorm and shoes no, an event versus the walk. Um, some of the other things just on, on this slide, um, we've been continuing to host student services meetings, partnering with DCF to really make sure we have the re latest research and access and supports for all of our staff as we build their capacity. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, our training with Lynn Lyons that we had partnered with the CPAC and Austin Prep on because of um, her uh, personal issue, we have to reschedule it, but she's also been um, consulting with the staff um, uh, to go through cases, which has been really, really helpful and nice this year. And don't forget Anxious Nation uh, next week. The last one um, that was really a bullet under our plan was to create an aligned safety centered processes and protocols. Um, to date, we have trained our central office administration, our principals, our assistant principals, our head of guidance, and all of our school psychologists and school nurses in um, the CSTAG protocol, which is a threat assessment protocol. I can tell you, unfortunately, we have used it at every single level this year, um, from rise all the way up. And it's really to see, is a student a threat to themselves or anybody else? And it's research-based, and how do we get those students support? Um, another like little coming soon, because we're always looking at the next best thing, the safety, the building safety plans, the state is actually changing them. So we're very excited to get them, uh, the new ones from the state, because we really feel like it's in line with what we're doing, which is this isn't just a medical health response plan, now it's gonna be a medical behavioral health response plan that every school is gonna have to fill out which is actually something we were adding in addition to what the state required. So we're excited to have the state come up with us. <coughs> and again, just I'm more than happy at any time to really kind of talk about all this data, data, more data, and aligning all of our systems with teaching and learning and SST and support because none of this happens in isolation. But it's very hard to do a, a presentation and, and be concise because so much <coughs> dovetails and there's so many systems pieces of work, um, which really leads into what anchors some of that is our tiered focus monitoring and our requirements around special ed and civil rights. 
So I'm going to jump in now and let Jen have a little break now. <laughs> um, so I, the next couple slides are, are some review of some of the processes that we've been going through this school year. So TFM, Tiered Focus Monitoring, we've already presented to you all about this process, but just want to give a very quick overview. Some of the slides are you've seen. It's, uh, we'll kind of go through those quickly. Um, so again, Tiered fo Focus Monitoring is a six-year process. Um, that breaks, that's broken down into two cycles, two three-year cycles, that's um, looking at our compliance in special education as well as in civil rights. This is just a graphic to show what the, the process um, looks like. Um, we, just so you can have a picture of where we are, we are currently in year five, which is at the bottom of the circle. Um, and this was this this cycle was around the civil rights and, and special education. There's a little bit of special education in, in Group B as well. <coughs> uh, this, these are the components you've all seen this slide already. It's just breaking down, so we have that grounding factor. Can go, can go back to look at what were the components of the review. It included document review. It, it re included. Um, a lot of interviews included site visits. So after all of that work, which I just said really quickly, it actually was a whole two years of work for us, um, and we did get our findings. So after all of that work, all of that buildup, <laughs> this was the email that we got from the state. The TFM re report has been approved with no findings. So, <laughs> it was really exciting for us. We actually all ran out of our offices and we're like, woo! <laughs> but that was the buildup, um, which we all laughed about. It was later followed up with a little bit more detail in a report that it is on, posted on our student services website. Um, if you go back and look at it, it's not super detailed. So just, just so you know, it's it's somewhat of a form, but um, we were ex very excited that, um, that uh, with all that work, that um, that was the end result. Um, so um, Joan Brinkerhoff was our monitoring specialist through, through DESE, and she is the um, contact that we worked with through this whole process. And following up that, that momentous email. Um, she did follow up later with this um, this email that's on the screen right now, um, and we just wanted to share that with you because we were very um, excited. She sent this email to, to Tom, Jen, and I. She said, I wanted to take the time to recognize the hard work you have committed to and accomplished over the course of the last couple of years. I would also like to connect some districts that may benefit from your direction and, and accomplishments if that is amenable to you. You should be proud of the work you do to create opportunities and re reduce the equity gaps for students. And as we know, this is still a work in progress, but we're really excited of the work that we've done and that they um, reached out. And we're really excited to partner with some other communities. I know that Joan has already connected us with some districts, um, and we're looking forward to that collaboration. Um, and as Jen mentioned, as we mentioned a couple times, everything is connected in all of the work that we do. And one of the um, other components that we're going to talk about next is our program reviews that we've been completing, which we've talked about several times through through meetings with you as well. Um, but this is really linked. This is also linked to our TFM and the standard that um, shows that. And just as a reminder. This regulation says that we do need to be reviewing our programs on a yearly basis. And that requirement says that it can be done either internally or externally. Uh, so these are just some of the goals of the program reviews, which we've talked about um, at length. The components of all of the evaluations. And then a review of some, the timeline of the evaluations that we've done over the past several years since Jen and I started as a, as a partnership. Um, and like I mentioned a moment ago, we can, these evaluations can be done either internally or externally um, with an outside consultant. And um, as we presented at the beginning of the year, um, last year we did do um, external evaluations with an outside um, 
an outside person or group um, with the Embark Soar Sail and Reach program. Uh, we are just finishing up the RISE evaluation this school year, so we just um, at the end of last week uh, met with the RISE staff uh, to review the recommendations from that evaluation. We're setting up a meeting with the parents as our next step to review, as we did with our other evaluations, we wanted to meet with the families within the program first. So the RISE families will be invited to a meeting to review the recommendations. And then we will be following that up with a presentation to you all later in the school year, I would say later this next month. We're almost at the end of the school year. Um, so that will be next month where we, we go over those recommendations to, with the school committee. Um, after that, we will be publishing the um, executive summary like we did with all of the other evaluations for the rest of the community. Uh, the Learning Center evaluation is underway. They are currently in our building. We just saw them last week and they said they feel like they live here. Um, that's Patrick Barbe Barbieri and Sally Smith. So we're really excited to um, have that work finish up their observations and interviews and data review will be finishing up by the end of this month and then they will start working on the report. Um, and then for next year, as you see on the timeline and as we've discussed before, the lead evaluation is our plan for next year. We are hoping, we have been um, looking at different consultants to complete this. We have some very um, good leads on this and we should be hearing in the next couple weeks um, on who we, should, we will be going forward with for that evaluation for next year. The next slide just talks a little bit about some of the history of the recommendations, which we've reviewed in previous, um, previous presentations. Um, this one is just talking about some of the focuses that we've had this year, looking at the program oversight, aligning our programs, um, additional staffing based on recommendations from all these evaluations, and focusing on the transition process, including um, hiring a transition specialist for next year. Um, so as I mentioned, the state is rolling out a new IEP, which I'm going to go into a little bit um, in a moment. But as they roll out this new IEP and as they start to review our data in preparation already for our next TFM, they're looking at all of this work through the lens of FAPE and LRE. These are a couple things that we just wanted to highlight. These are the guiding principles that the state is, is talking a lot about um, and things that we always need to be keeping in mind when we're running meetings and when we're, we're making those recommendations for our student. Um, so placement should be chosen individually for each student with a, from a full continuum of placement options. Sorry, it's not always working. Um, a placement in the general education environment is presumed. And teams must first consider if the eligible student may be served in the school and the classroom that the student would attend if not, not disabled. So we're always supposed to be looking at their home school environment first in order to determine um, what is, how do we provide that free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. Um, as I mentioned, the state is already starting to talk to us about our next TFM, even though we haven't even gotten to year six yet. We're already talking about the next cycle. Um, so this is just some of the data that they started to, um, Joan started to talk to Jen and I about, and they were really looking at um, comparing where our, our data was in, in 2020 in comparison with um, where we are now. So some of the highlights that they really wanted us to, to be looking at is our overall percentage um, of our students in partial inclusion programs and our number of students that are out of district um, in comparison to, to where the state average is. And as you can see that our um, numbers are a little higher in those two areas than, than the state average. 
So those are areas that we're really looking at um, as we are doing this work over the next couple years as that um, t next TFM comes through. Awesome. Allison. Allison. Mm -hmm. Quick, um, how do we make sure that just because there's a desire or bias, for lack of a better way to say it, for LRE, if, it's, if, it, if these 16.5 students really do need partial inclusion, how do we make sure that we're not just pushing towards full inclusion if they can't actually succeed in full inclusion? That's a really good question and something that we really are looking at at the very individual level and that's really, that is our focus that we can't, you're right, we can't just automatically just be pushing everybody towards full inclusion but that's where we're having those very meaningful, very individualized student conversations at the team level. And where data comes into play. This mm -hmm. is why we need good data collection systems, good assessment systems, because if you're not making progress at the rate we would expect, then obviously you more need more direct instruction in a different methodology or a different setting. Um, and we're working very closely with our team chairs, especially as we continue to develop our programs, to be able to say, this is the additional support the student needs in order to make progress. I think what the state is asking us to look at is, are we, are we setting you on a trajectory that we've, we've said this is the level of progress that you need and we've never reduced it, if you can have it reduced, or are we constantly looking at it critically to say, yep, this is the right amount of service, Nope, you need more, or nope, you need less. That we're not just overgeneralizing in the other direction as well. Part of the reason I asked the question is the, the fear I have um, as a parent with a child on an IEP is that it's already a, a huge weight against the parent in the room when you're in a team, a team conversation. Huge. So now you have the, the weight of the state coming down to make that an even bigger weight against the parent in the room. So I think we, and my, my concern here is that, yes, we do want least restrictive, as long as the student can succeed. And your point about data is critical, right? Making sure that we have that. But I also want to make sure that we as a district are, at least from my perspective, and I'm just one of six, right, from a committee perspective, we as a district are making sure that our staff understands that while this is something they're pushing, if it's appropriate, great. If it's not, we don't want to add the weight on top of the parent's head, and for that matter, the student's head, by saying you have to go full inclusive. Um, and I know that's never the intent, yeah. but some of the times these kind of things come across in a way that can become very heavy, and, and not from you guys necessarily. Your office is not in that, in that mold, but that's definitely something that we'll hear feedback from, like, oh, their state's doing this now. And Maria, tell me if I'm out of line. but. I, I, I've had some experiences with, with myself and with other parents saying that I'm just outvoted. I'm one of eight in the room and I lose the team meeting and therefore it's done. Um, so. so that's heartbreaking to me and yep. I know that has been a perspective and one of the reasons why Allison and I have been offering office hours because it should never be us against them. You Sometimes we're gonna have productive disagreements, mm -hmm. but they're also parents are have the final say around rejection. Allison and I have taken a very um, proactive approach, I hope people would agree, yep. to resolve conflict um, through mediation, through agreements, to really move things forward in the best interest of the student. But I think your point is well taken and really truly for me it hinges back on tell me what the student needs. Mm -hmm. And the day I stop asking that question is the day I don't belong in this job anymore. Tell me what's best for this student. And um, I go back, uh, Tom makes fun of me on my board in my office. I have a copy of the hedgehog concept from over the summer. And we're constantly asking the team chairs again, what's our passion? We believe students can succeed. The money or driver in our case is compliance. And what can we be the best in the world at is making connections and listening to students and families. When we hit that sweet spot in the middle of those three, then we know what we're doing, what's right, and hopefully it's gonna align with the state. And if there are outliers, then we wanna be able to explain to the state why. The last time we were found in non-compliance on something, Allison literally went student by student by student, and the state changed their 
determination because we were able to build the case. But that's where if we don't have data and systems, it's never going to work. <laughs> that's exactly where I was going to go as the final point here is how, you know, of these 16 and a half and 13 point versus, you know, 16 and a half and 7.3, you all are reviewing them at least on an annual basis in the team meeting, in some cases more regularly because the team may ask to meet on a more regular basis for some reason. So are we capturing so that Allison doesn't have to go spend two days <laughs> locked in a room, you know, that this 16.5% is real and, you know, we can stand up for it and say, listen, we go through this process and here it is, boom, 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 boom. You know, we're putting them in least restrictive so they can be successful and we're seeing growth, you know, and, you know, maybe, you know, Joey or Sally or whatever in two years can get into full inclusion, but right now they're where they need to be. Yeah. Um, so we've actually updated our data systems. We found a lot of glitches between like Redeker and Eastbed that, that have been created, but more to the student level in the system, absolutely. And we're also talking about how critical it is with reading instruction. You may get pulled out more frequently in second, third, fourth grade because fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, we want you back included. And yep. so doing 30 minutes, um, you know, 30 minutes, five days a cycle, what is that equal to versus if it was an hour of direct intensive instruction, are we then filling that need and getting you back into general ed? So it's not as simple as a piece of paper and with numbers, we agree. You've been so patient. <laughs> I feel like I might be wrong about this, but even compared to the state, we're a relatively wealthy town and that tends to come with more access to like medical care and earlier diagnosis of learning disabilities and things like ADHD, ADD, um, dyslexia. Could that be kind of like skewing our numbers higher towards partial inclusion rather than full inclusion? You ask fabulous questions. <laughs> I think with the state, you, you are right. We absolutely have some advantages that other communities don't have. I think what the state is looking at is there's two sections of the IEP where they talk about level of need and then level of service. And the way the state disaggregates that data, they're saying we're off. Our, what we're saying is some of the students' level of need, we're giving them more level of service than they, they should have in the state's assumption. Our job is to now look at that and figure out why. And ultimately, what I would love to do to your point, because we have all of these early warning screeners and indicators, we are hoping that the majority of students are, are able to get intervention in general education to never get to that wait to fail model where the parents are sitting at team meetings talking about specially designed instruction um, for students who could have that curriculum support. And then other students are gonna need different levels of support and we want it to be whatever is best for them, allowing them to be in with their general ed peers as much as possible. Because there are some amazing things happening in some classrooms right now that students wouldn't be able to do um, a few years ago when we'd just have them in a substantially separate class. We're almost done, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to derail that part of the conversation. Um, so the next slide talks about the, the new IEP that will be coming out. Um, so it is called the DESE IEP Improvement Project. That is the title from the state. That's not our title, just so everybody is aware. <laughs> um, this, there's a lot, of, a, a lot of narrative on this, um, on this slide, but this is really so people can go back and look at what are the, the goals and the theory behind the improvement pro project. Um, the next slide just highlights a few of those, um, the principles within their, the, the goal. And if you look through that list of the principles, a lot of those things, these things are things that Jen and I have talked about throughout this presentation and things that we're working on every day, all the time. Um, looking at all students um, are considered for the general ed setting first, the general ed teacher, the general ed and special ed should be working closely together. Um, that we're always looking at that continuing, continuous cycle of improvement, that assessment is so important, it's key, and that, in, that family engagement really matters. Um, so a lot of similarities in all the work that we're focusing on um, all the time. Um, I did make a correction on this slide from what was in the packet, just so everybody is aware that um, the 
our timeline for implementation is for the um, beginning of the um, 23, 24 school, no, no, 24, 25 school year. Um, and um, so we can be taking next year, the 23, 24 school year, to do all the training. And um, we'll be talking more about that next year um, with, the, with CPAC and with um, our families to really prepare <clears throat> for that. And so, in sum, with all of this, we worked really hard um, to develop a logo for student services because what we kept hearing was the same thing all the time. We hear it from staff, we hear it from families, all means all. If you've said all means all, prove it is what they've, we've heard repeatedly. And we believe it and we own it. And um, we actually created several different logos with several different sayings and asked the student services and special ed staff to vote on it. And this is the logo that everybody um, ended up going with. Um, all means all, every learner, every day. Um, one of the, the close contenders was every learner, every classroom. But really, this goes beyond the classroom. We have students in out-of-district placements that come back to Reading High to participate in extracurricular activities. We have students that, and staff that are going to walks and, and rallies outside of the school day. This is really, truly, every day we mean this work. It is who we are, and we believe it. We believe in our staff and our families and our students, so you will hopefully see more of this loca. That's it. We are done. One more question. Can you go back a couple slides to the, the DESE IEP thing? Um, as I was looking through that and reading through it, um, the next one before that one, it, it struck me that this isn't really just IEP related when you think about it. I could easily change IEP to be MLL and the same thing should apply. And so my, my, my question or thought here, obviously you changed some of the, the actors to a degree, but um, earlier this year we had a presentation on actually same, like MLL and ARC was right around that same point. My perception based on that presentation is we're not quite integrating our MLL with our reading implementation well enough yet. And I'd love to hear more at some point in the future about how we can get to that. There's a lot of research out there about that as well. Um, and I know that the team is working really hard to bring that population up to speed, but the integration and getting them fully included in the in those classrooms will help with that as well. So I'd love to hear more about how we can change the that model as well to be more of a full inclusion model in some way, shape, or form. And that may mean coming to us for funding for additional staff and other things along those lines. Whether we can figure that out is another story altogether, but if we don't know what's blocking it, we certainly can't solve it. <clears throat> Just a, um, a comment and then a quick question. Um, so on the TFM, that sort of anticlimactic email, as with any sort of audit, no news is good news, right? So congratulations on, on that and uh, on the recognition from our, our uh, monitoring expert as well. Um, I, I don't want to front run the socialization of the, of the RISE uh, program review, so I'll, you know, a simple yes or no would suffice. Um, we made a lot of... Um, we made a lot of new investments in next year's budget on the basis of the other program reviews that have been completed. Is there anything that came out of the RISE one that suggests any of that was sort of misaligned with um, also improving right. the state of the state with RISE? So, great question. I'm going to go a little deeper than yes or no. Okay. There was not um, some big, giant surprise ad. What we were able to confirm is um, separating out the team chair and director role has been critical. Um, and to my data point, we actually have been working with the RISE staff to determine like what are the extra things the team chair has been able to do, what are the extra things the director has been able to do by expanding those two roles, um, including really working on the culture. Um, and that's really some of the stuff that's going to come out of that. So I think what you'll hear is we have some work to do. 
but financially we've made the right decisions and are continuing to grow those op options. Okay. Great. Thank you. Carla. So um, as part of my day in the schools, a couple of those hours was in RISE, which I loved and I could have stayed there all day. Um, and when I started asking questions of the staff of um, what, what could you use that you don't have, one thing that came out was to have a social worker in RISE um, <clears throat> because of all the issues of kids coming in with, with trauma needs. Um, and I said, wow, we, we have them at all other levels, um, but we, we don't have that at RISE. So that was just something, and I talked to Dr. Malachewski about it, um, but that was something that made a lot of sense to me. So we're the budget people. I guess that's part of it too, but yeah. Just I comment. think, if, and we are gonna, we decided to, given this was a bit of a lengthy presentation, we decided to separate out the RISE program review and we'll talk a bit about that coming up. We have been trying to meet that need using our other social work staff. We've added, we've really added a lot over the last couple of years, especially the two RISE classrooms, um, the four RISE classrooms that are in Killam. Um, and what end they have access to those social workers, the rise at the high school, um, we're working on making sure the high school staff are able to support for some of those needs as well. But we are seeing those kind of issues sure. with our youngest learners, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Chuck. I'm good. No, that was going to be my point. Before we hire another social worker, we should see what capacity who, who's already here can, can do to help them. Sarah, any uh, questions on your end? Okay. Mrs. Morgan. Yeah, please. Um, and it's probably best if you come sit next to Jada. You'll be picked up on uh, Zoom better. Sure. Whatever's comfortable. Whatever's comfortable for you. We're good to do it. Okay, I have the world's small, smallest note paper here. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so I'm Maria Morgan. I'm um, one of the board members of the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And um, I just wanted to come and acknowledge um, the hard work of, you know, I wanted to hear, first of all, the presentation, but I also want to acknowledge the hard work that Jen and Allison put in. Um, and family engagement is just so important, and I know CPAC will be presenting um, at the end of June, um, and, and we'll talk about it then, but I, I just cannot say enough how important family engagement is, and it, it saddens me, too, to hear um, the perspective, and I, I know that that perspective that Tom shared is, like, alive and well among a lot of people in Reading, and I, I just don't feel that like personally I don't feel it but I know that that is out there and so I think it's that we have a 671 in, in 2020 students on IEPs our email list is only 309 people so like I want to get to everybody um, but I do want to say that um, Jen and Allison make you know that the work a lot easier for us to do that um, you know they they understand that family engagement piece and they they work with us really well um, and as a parent you know I I feel listened to I feel heard um, and I just I want to acknowledge the amount of work um, in these reviews this year I'm I was overwhelmed as a CPAC board member like having to deal with all the reviews I can only imagine how much work it was um, on their end um, I'm glad that there's a little bit of respite from that um, and just some things I was writing down while you were speaking um, you know, I, I feel like we're in a district. I'm, I'm thrilled that we were found, you know, in compliance. And I think that's really important to note that that's not always the case. Um, and we're in a place where we do have access to the table. I really believe that we do. Um, you know, I had a parent this week call and she was kind of like brainstorming with me and bouncing ideas off of me. And she was like, all her ideas were the right ideas, like working with the team. And like, there were things that were stuck at the team level. So, but she's, she's finding success, like using those strategies and the message is coming from the top. So I, I really truly believe that we have reason to have hope. And I hope, um, you know, I, I would love for you to share those folks with me because I want to, because I really don't think that we need to feel that way. And it's, it hasn't always been smooth sailing for us as parents, you know, in my family. But, oh my gosh, my son this year, it's like, like all of them thriving. I mean, amazing. It, um, but it, it, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work 
parents it is it's 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 more work than it it should be i guess but it, it like it is what it is you know it's it's a lot of work because as a parent you're the only one who knows your kid that much so like yeah you do you do have to really you know work hard and feel strong in that and having that voice and i guess i can see why like people would feel like oh it's weighted against you but you know i don't have that feeling because i'm an educator but I just, I just don't want them to have that feeling. I think I did when, when he was younger, and I, I don't feel that way now. And I hope that parents can um, access CPAC because um, we do a lot of work, and, and Jen and Allison really help us do that work and find people that aren't at the table and reach those under-reached um, folks. We've been working really hard on that. Um, and uh, da, 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 I just wanted to say, da, da, da. oh, and I wanted to also um, thank all the folks this year in student services who had to take on like. I don't even get it, but the program coordinators, like people are, I don't know how they're doing all that. The team chair role is already so hard that some of them are stepping in and now being program coordinators too. Um, I just, I really want to like express our thanks um, to everybody who's taking on that work. And finally, I would like to really um, say how impressed I am with Jada. And I, I taught her, I don't know if she remembers, for like a few months at Parker and when you were in sixth grade. I worked there for a little bit. Do you remember? I remember you. <laughs> you impressed me then and you're impressing me even more today. I'm so impressed with all your questions so thank you so much for being here and doing all the work you do and uh, yeah that's it thank you guys thank you thanks Maria <laughs> how about that Jada <laughs> <laughs> Miss Hawkinson had me last year and she was like I remember having you in gym in like second grade and I was like oh dear God <laughs> <laughs> yeah she used to be JE gym teacher yeah all right um, Anything else on this topic before we uh, adjourn into our executive session? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah. Thank Appreciate you. it. And we're looking forward to uh, a number of other special education student services related updates coming soon. So thank you. Um, okay, so Carla, can we uh, do a motion, please? Sure. I motion to enter into executive session in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, the superintendent, and to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body, the Reading Teachers Association, and the, and the chair so declares. We will be returning to open session in approximately 45 minutes. Second. Seconded by Tom. I never know exactly what to say here, so I'll I say declare. I so declare. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we will take a roll call vote on this one as well. Chuck? Yes. Tom? Yes. Carla? Yes. Sarah? And Sean, yes. We uh, will go to executive session and we'll return in about 45 minutes. We take a brief break on the way We can exec. take a quick break on the way.
Call us back to order. Uh, I think we have to roll call again to yes. call back to order for open session. Sarah? Here. Chuck? Here. Tom? Here. Carla? Here. And Sean here. Um, okay, so the next item of business is uh, uh, an update on the <coughs> successor contract for the superintendent and the public vote um, of the same. Um, so we have uh, reached agreement with Dr. Milicheski on the terms of a successor contract, um, which will take effect on July 1 of this year. Um, I'm going to summarize sort of the key details of the contract. Um, the, the contract itself, of course, is a public record and will be posted uh, publicly um, within the next few days. Um, so the key elements of the contract, uh, the term is for six years. Um, we, uh, Dr. Milicheski's base salary beginning the next um, fiscal year, so again, July 1 of 2023, will be $214,000. Um, uh, the contract has a stipulation that subject to proficient or exemplary performance in the performance year, um, his annual increase on that contract will be no less than 2.5% and the school committee retains the option to um, offer more than 2.5% in a given year. Um, there's a clause in Dr. Milczewski's existing contract which we're uh, modifying, um, which is a, a travel expense clause essentially. Um, that clause is for $4,000 uh, for essentially a car allowance. Um, we wanted to recognize that Dr. Milczewski spends a lot of nighttime and weekend hours in the community and we certainly don't want the, uh, there to be a disincentive for that to continue um, and so that travel expense is, is um, uh, connected to that as well. Um, one of the other major components that we should summarize here. The, uh, oh, we also have um, uh, longevity payments. Um, so this is a six year contract, which is um, probably the longest one we've had in town for a while. Um, it's not, you know, long by historical standards necessarily, and it's certainly certainly allowable uh, under state law. Um, but what the, the six years really sort of represents is um, a commitment to stability in this district, a commitment to executing on the vision that I think we've laid out collectively over the last few years under Dr. Milicheski's leadership, um, and a uh, commitment to seeing that through. So we're, we're very excited to um, be reaching agreement on the six year term. From the beginning, Dr. Milicheski expressed his um, his uh, desire to be here, that you know, he's got, there are other opportunities out there. Um, I think at one point recently there were 37 active superintendent searches in the state. Um, so we are, uh, we're pleased to have him um, committing to staying here for the foreseeable future. So to that end, um, one other component of the contract is, is a longevity payment. Um, at the end of the next five fiscal years, um, Dr. Milicheski will be, uh, will be awarded, I suppose, a longevity payment of $2,000, again, subject to proficient or exemplary performance in the, in the given performance year. Um, and should he complete the entire contract um, uh, at the end of the sixth year, subject to proficient or exemplary performance in five of the six contract years, this gets a little bit hairy, but I think I just got all the details right, um, there's a payment in that sixth year, a, a, a longevity payment of $15,000 should he complete the contract under those terms. Um, this, is a, this is a structure that we saw in some other, uh, other neighboring districts and as we really thought about how do we create an incentive for this um, to be the long-term commitment that the contract is on the face, um, we thought that was a, sort of an appropriate mechanism to use. So we're excited about that as well. Um, anything else from a highlights perspective? Otherwise we'll take a vote or we'll take a motion sure. first. I move to, and we are pleased to ratify a superintendent successor contract with Dr. Milicevsky. Is there a second? Second. And um, is there any further discussion? As amended. Uh, yeah, it's not amended for the purpose of, yeah, this one, yep. Yeah. Um, okay, any further discussion? I'll just. Tom, go ahead. Just a quick statement, I think. Um, you know, I'm excited that that Dr. Milicheski is going to be here for the six years. Uh, I think that their first two years have been a really great start. Obviously, we haven't finished the review cycle for this year, so we can't say what that's going to end up as. But um, we've seen collaboration. We've seen focus on excellence. We've seen focus on all. We even heard about it for the last hour before we went to executive session, all, all, all students improving. We've seen great relationships formed across the board. Uh, we've seen growth in our staff from a principal perspective through to the, each of the, the, the teachers and whatnot. Um, we've seen excitement across the district. 
um, you know, you can't attribute it all to one person because he'll deflect it and say it's all part of the central office and the way that they run thing. But even that is evidence of, of the work that he's already done. And so um, I'm excited about it and I hope and it sounds like he is as well. So I'm um, looking forward to this. And I, I do think it is, it is a, I don't, monumental is not the right word, but I think it's a, it's a, a good thing that we're, we're making this commitment to him and he's conversely making the commitment to us as well. Agreed. Well said. Okay. Uh, so with that, we'll move to the vote and we'll do a roll call again. Sarah? Aye. Chuck? Aye. Tom? Aye. Carla? Aye. And Sean? Aye. Um, so we will uh, formally ratify the contract later this week and again, the, the um, or we'll sign, sign the contract, I should say, execute it later this week and then it'll be made available uh, on our website as well. Um, and I'll just say, yeah, I'll, go ahead. Okay, I, I'll just jump into just to uh, thank the committee um, for moving forward. I'm, I'm really excited. I love coming to work every day. Um, this is a great district. It's a great place to be. I think there's a lot of really exciting things happening, and I think we're all really excited about what's ahead here in the future. So I appreciate your belief in me and your belief in uh, our team and looking forward to continuing to work with you over the next several years to continue to try to deliver <coughs> the best educational experience we can for all of our students. So, um, again, really excited about the direction, but also know we have plenty of work ahead. And Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so we've got just a handful of other uh, agenda items, which I think um, should move relatively quickly here. In old business, uh, we did issue some some minor updates to the uh, calendar for next year. Um, this was all based on feedback that we provided in it back in March. Um, so the the dates for the elementary and high school back to school nights in September have been swapped. Um, the May open house night was moved to Thursday of the same week. Um, the idea was to have um, to have the elementary back to school night and the open house nights closer to Friday, which is when teachers kind of have their planning and prep time. So that was just sort of preferable timing, um, just within the scale of the week. Um, Dr. Milczewski, any other uh, any other comments on the updated calendar? It's really minor. I'm not even sure. It's, it's not even clear to me that we necessarily need to vote on this, but. Um, I figured we should anyway. Yeah, this is also the version that's already on our district right. website too. So for families who've already printed out and put in their uh, fridge, I, you can check this, but I think this should be the one that seems to be already updated out there. Okay. Um, Carla, can we take a motion? I motion to approve an updated SY 2324 calendar. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Sarah? Aye. Uh, Chuck? Aye. Tom? Aye. Carla? Aye. And Sean, aye, five zero. Okay, um, school choice. So uh, folks will recall that last year was the first year, I don't know if ever, but certainly since I've been paying attention to the school committee that we did not opt out of the school choice program, so de facto opted in um, and then uh, opened some seats and, and enrolled some students in school choice. Um, so we annually need to have the discussion about whether we um, want to continue down that path or, or exercise the option to um, opt out. So that's what this agenda item is about. We may or may not, in fact, have a vote, but Dr. Milczewski, I'll, I'll kick it to you to kind of kick off the topic and then we'll, we'll discuss and see what the tenor of the committee is. I just have a couple of points. I know that the committee is pretty familiar with school choice at this point and a lot of information is outlined in the packet. Uh, a couple of small things first. Um, we had nine students this year in, uh, participate in school choice, which uh, led to additional 42,000, uh, 42,500 in funding for FY24. Uh, Eight, you know, we had uh, eight students who were one, grades one through 12 and one kindergarten student, which comes at 2,500. Um, so we also feel like this has been a good strategy for us to start to recruit and retain uh, some of our staff members. We know that many of those nine students are either our relatives of staff members. We have also started to hear from uh, some staff members this year that they're interested in their children or, you know, nieces, nephews uh, coming to writing as part of school choice. Um, so you'll see in the packet outlined just the number of seats, a couple of just uh, thresholds for us that we used in determining the amount of open seats. Uh, kindergarten grade one, we limited class size to 19. I think we're especially sensitive to uh, kindergarten and some of that, how that can fluctuate. Uh, grades two and three, limited class size of 20, and grades four and five, limited class size of 22. And we did not add a more than four, open up more than four seats in one grade level in one school. 
I'd also like to make it kind of clear to the community that we don't anticipate filling all of these seats. Last year, we opened up a similar number of seats and landed on nine. If I had to guess, I think we may be slightly higher this year, uh, just from some of the interest that we've heard, but I don't think that we're going to see a major uptick unless we also do some uh, a, a different strategy in terms of marketing and getting the message out there. Um, I think at this point, we're fine uh, opening these seats because we think we have the space, but at the same time, um, kind of you know moving forward in our messaging and marketing maybe on a smaller scale. Um, I'll think that's it because I think we've talked about it a bunch, but I'll pause there. If there's questions or conversation. Yeah, I, I would say. I mean, I don't. I don't think really anything has changed for me from last year. I don't um, personally desire to opt out. Um, and I, I'll just make one quick comment. I do appreciate the the thoughtfulness about um, not going to the full potential class sizes, and you know, in the elementary level in particular, um, so that uh, you know. The students who or the families who live here in Reading don't feel like their classes are getting squeezed and that sort of thing, um, and you know for the benefit of the students as well, the class sizes are kept uh, quite manageable. So um, appreciate that thoughtfulness, and um, you know I, I certainly hear you that we're not likely to get anywhere near 75, 75 uh, new students coming in. Um, so this really just represents kind of where the openings are more than the sort of the expectation. Chuck, it's Tom, do we uh, or are we? planning to keep any data as to why somebody wants to come to Reading? I mean, is that a question that's asked on the application? It is not on the application, but it's a great question. I think question. it's important to, because, you know, some of that may drive, you know, the way we want to do things. Yeah. I think that's a great question. We did not collect that data outside of just last year, outside of just anecdotal data. Like, for example, I can think on top of my head four or five of my sort of know their circumstance. I see Olivia already jotting down. I think that's a good thing for our team to We track. already know it's if great, it's a staff member, but I'm more interested great question. in, you know, like. Is it for sports? Yeah. Well, yeah. why? <laughs> or or, or the, our, our core, yeah. you know, stuff. That's I mean, a great point, Chuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say why and all. And, um, and how do they? How are they notified? How do they find out one yeah. thing? But I, I love the why. Yeah. Love the why. Can, can I suggest we we think about whether or not we want to put that on the application because we're not using it as screening criteria? Yeah. Versus, no, do we want yeah. to just collect the information yeah. from like, families that opt? Like an exit, it, like an interview yeah. after they started or something. It's a great question. Yeah. Once we call, we did call all families last year to notify them when they were accepted. We can also just ask that so too. Just we're, we're collecting some of this data. Yep. It's helpful for us in yep. interest in us. Yeah. So. Particularly yep. if we ever do get into a mode where we want to do, you know, sort of active recruiting right. um, for school choice, then it'd be helpful to have that data. It's a great Good point. Good call out. Um, go ahead, Tom. So, um, you know, Dr. Milchowski and I spoke about this a little earlier um, today. I guess time's flying on me. Um, whether or not to, you know, proactively advertise or not proactively advertise. Um, this because of the potential revenue opportunity that comes with it as well. Um, and I think I, I think I'm okay for the current year that we don't proactively notify or advertise, despite the fact that I've been pushing for it in the past. Um, because I still think, because after the conversation, um, I think it's probably beneficial for us to understand another year of, of data around how this works for us or not. But I do think at some point in time, once we see that it's working a certain way or, or whatnot, it's it, it may be so maybe it's next year we start thinking about more proactive, um, you know, advertising to the point of how do they hear right now? You know, they're really only if they're actively searching, are they hearing, or if they're a staff member, um, are they are they hearing? Um, but I think a lot of neighboring towns probably would opt in if they had the choice and if they knew about it. Um, so while I'm, again, I'm not I'm perfectly comfortable not proactively advertising this year. Do they get something we should plan for and execute for next year after we had a, a couple years of data? about how the program runs. And just a point of legality here, Sean, I don't think we're not going to vote for it, but we, if we were to opt out, we have to have a public hearing first, so we can't vote for opting out today anyway. Oh, interesting. Have like, we structured a public, do we, we, we have a public, public hearing last year? Yep. No. Yep. Good catch. Go ahead, Chuck. Uh, you know, I, I, I hear what, what you're saying, Tom. I just, I would, if we are going to have a discussion, of, I, if we are going to start marketing more, I want to have a discussion because that's, I think, a slippery slope uh, in terms of when we're trying to keep an eye on class sizes. And, and well, that's why the plan, I mean, I agree with you 100%. We should have the conversation beforehand. We should understand what the sizes are, where we are, 
you know, I think the you know, the conversation Tom and I had were, it was more along the lines of, okay, we're asked, and there was an yeah. illusion at that town meeting, like, you know, this class size and the, and the population of the, of the you know, you know, enrollment going, and you know, what does that mean from a staffing perspective? And we know, at least right now, with, our, with the McGibbons forecast, we're going to be relatively flat for a period of time, mm. right? So as long as we believe that forecast, and we should reassess it every year or so, um, then we will have space, but not enough space that we can start saying we don't need teacher X, teacher Y, teacher Z. So at that point, it becomes kind of a, how do we make sure we optimize that? Now, that's obviously going to weigh against the class size conversation. So yes, there's space, but, you know, am I overburdening and saying, you know, 24, 25, 26? We don't want to go there necessarily, but, you know, what's the right level is obviously a, a continuous conversation. The numbers in the in the presentation that were they, the memo that's outlined keep us well below most of our standard numbers that we've had out there. So in the, if we were to fill those spots, we'd still be in okay, in okay shape, mm -hmm. and then we'd have less next year. We're not going to fill 75 spots, I don't think. Maybe 10, uh -huh. maybe 15 this year. Correct. But that's Go from 9 to 75. <laughs> right. So. Okay. So I'm not hearing any desire to opt out for the next school year, so we don't need to post a public hearing for our next meeting. Thank you. Good, good catch. Um, turns out to be moot, so that's good. <laughs> uh, anything else on this topic before we move on and essentially close the book on this for this year? Okay. Um, and then our final order of business is um, there's a letter in the packet that I drafted. Um, we've, we the, there were four um, earmarks submitted on behalf of the school district, and they're, they're outlined in the packet. There's, there's one for the RMHS Science Department, one for the Arts Department, one for the Math Department, and then one for Keys to Literacy, which is really focused on uh, middle school literacy training, um, uh, training for teachers, I should say, in the area of literacy. Um, uh, I just drafted a, a relatively straightforward note you know, typical sort of pomp and circumstance um, that I'd like to send on behalf of the committee to our delegation on Beacon Hill just to reinforce our support for these earmarks and ask them to support them during the process as well. Um, so I'll take any feedback or edits or grotesque grammar mistakes or whatnot. Um, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll take a vote either on it as amended or, or as it's in the packet and then um, move forward appropriately from there. So any discussion? Tom, go ahead. So first of all, thank you for doing this, and Dr. Milicheski, thank you for gathering the feedback and input to get to get this far. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to get anywhere near this amount as it stands right now, um, and it makes me wonder if we should be thinking about this from a priority perspective. And I'm sure you already had a conversation, and twenty-five thousand is what came down, and the, what could be fit into the twenty-five thousand, and the three pianos, and all that stuff is is probably what the agreement was. Um, you know, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about how that happened, um, but I'd also like to think about, is that our priority, and if so, why? Um, there are things in here, you know, no, not meaning to put any shade on the, on the Performing Arts Department, which is phenomenal. Uh, maybe with that, with that was our option because there are other ways we can achieve grant money for the other things, and we couldn't achieve it for pianos. Maybe that's the answer. I'm just guessing at this point in time. Um, maybe it's a decent guess, but, <laughs> um, but I... I would have prioritized other things more highly, personally. That's just one person's vote, but I'm curious to hear how we ended up where we ended up, as far as you understand. Great question. So we, this, this year our strategy was what are all the things that we know are not, you know, that are one-time funding that we don't currently have sort of uh, a set funding source for, and we're not going to get if we don't ask. So we said we're going to ask for, we asked around what are some of the things that we know are on our radar that we, we need, to, and we submitted all of them as potential earmarks, and we didn't, let, we didn't prioritize, like a, make a, a rank list. We were just notified at the same time as everyone else in the community how what went through for the keyboards. So I didn't I didn't have a chance to advocate for sort of one higher than the other. Now is that a lesson learned that next year we should prioritize or maybe at least have a conversation with some of our legislators in advance and let them know sort of internally what our ranking is? I don't know. That's something we can certainly discuss, but there was no additional conversation to prioritize outside of what's been submitted. Okay, so then given that, Sean, are you okay? Uh-huh. Yeah. Given that, um, First of all, it's only the House side of the budget that we have this earmark in so far. Yeah. So there's still a reconciliation process and, you know, potentially working with Senator Lewis and then with our House constituents to adjust that if we don't feel like it's the right, the right association of money. Or advocating for, say, 15000 more to get something yeah. else. Um, 
especially considering what we've been hearing about, you know, where we are with middle school and literacy and whatnot. Um, so would it behoove us to prioritize this as a committee and adjust the letter in a priority form and ask for reconsideration and the reconciliation budget as a result? It's a loaded question, so, right? So can I ask, yeah. so this letter already went out? No. No. So then why are you saying uh, resubmit? I'm not saying resubmit. I'm saying we haven't sent this letter, but we did send, you, you probably remember, we sent an email to, or Dr. Milcheski sent an email at Fidel's request and Brad right. Jones's request or whatnot, right? To, to say these are our asks. We, so, last year we followed up with a, a letter supporting, so Sean's following that model. So this is just right? codifying what we already asked this for. This is codifying what we already asked for. And so my question is, That's because we know idea. where we are, do we want to codify it in a more or prioritized fashion? change our ask? Is that I mean, it must matter where the, the funding source is coming from, from the state. It's an earmark. It comes from nowhere, anywhere, nowhere. It yeah. matter. <laughs> um, then why not just give it outright? <laughs> because it's an earmark. You have to right? say what it's for. I, I, I'm of the opinion that our state senator is chair of the Education Commission. Um, and until the door is closed, we should advocate for all of these worthy things. Um, now, you know, should we put some prioritization on it? I don't know. I don't know what the right sort of strategy there is. Um, or should we view the door closed on the, you know, arts department being something other than what the house has already appropriated? I don't know. Um, but I, I just don't see, you know, I don't know. I mean, I There's don't. No clear answer. I'm sorry, Tom. Uh, I, I, I don't know how we can at this point in time put any prioritization on it. I mean, we'd have to go back to the to the staff to ask. I mean, we can't do that here tonight. We but, have the yeah. staffs. We have the, the head of the staff who gathered all the information. <laughs> yeah. What, what I could share is that, first, I think we're thrilled that the, we already have the $25,000 in there for the digital piano. I think it's exciting. And I think if we're going to advocate for more, I think we could probably talk about this more after, but I think that there's some things in here we think we can pursue through other funding mechanisms, particularly some of the grants around skills capital grant, innovation pathways grants that obviously we can chip away at some of it here because it's additional flexibility. The one thing that we don't have an additional sort of funding, possible funding mechanism right now is the keys to literacy. So if I were to say, if we were to, to kind of thank the, you know, the delegation for their work and, you know, getting the $25,000 in there for uh, some of the RMHS Arts Department, we could say, you know, as we reviewed a lot of these requests, this one continues to come to the top, and we advocate for this sort of one to find its way back into sort of the next round, too. So if I were to prioritize at this point or ask for something additional, that would be it. I think there might be some creativity, the work Jess Callen is doing some of these other areas. I don't know with the key to literacy piece. And I do think they've, in the past, historically, if you look at some of the earmarks, there's been some that have been allocated towards literacy-based sort of items as well. So I think we have a reasonable ask. So if we are going to advocate something specific, that would be my Call direction. Call first among equals. For, yeah, yeah. Could do, I mean, I, I think that's where my head was as well, is that the capital skills related stuff yeah. could potentially address both the math department with regards to computer science related information, the science department with regards to some of the stuff they're doing there. Um, and that's why I was sort of thinking the pianos came out of, you know, the arts department thing because capital skills probably isn't going to hit yeah. that, right? So I was okay with that. But, yes, Keys to Literary was my, Literacy was my big hit, and I'll just call a spade a spade. There's $600,000 last year in the budget for Cambridge for reading recovery. For us to ask for 40000 is not a big ask, not a big ask at all. Um, and I think we should be pushing pretty heavily in that space um, if we can. That's... That's my number one priority of all of these. That's probably not surprising to any of the five of us that are on this call. Um, but anyway. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, th I, think it, I think it would be interesting just to find out what their process yeah. looks like, yeah. too. Just um, yeah. because it's not like, you know, they didn't fully fund one item. 
right? Yeah. They, they partially funded or they one item. So, um, so why did they choose that item? Right, so if we could find out what their process is. I mean, it doesn't hurt to ever ask, right? Correct. Um, so does that look like we send a, do we send this letter as is and then we follow up with additional communication? Does that look like? I would say we change this letter. And say we, we know, we, we appreciate that we asked for these four things. We appreciate that the house budget has funded 25,000 of this one. Um, it is, if it is the collective, it is the collective belief of the committee that the biggest bang that we can't fund in any other way currently, you know, with other sort of grants would be the keys to literacy one. We'd ask you to reconsider to somehow figure out how to get that into the reconciled budget. I think that's reasonable. Are we okay if they take the twenty-five thousand and put it into the keys to literacy? Uh, we're not saying we're not saying it. We're not nece going to explicitly necessarily say it takes precedence over the twenty-five thousand that's already been sort of awarded. We're saying. We'd ask that you take a second look at this list and particularly consider keys to literacy where we don't have other readily available funding sources um, that we could potentially tap or grant sources or what have you that we could potentially tap. So um, I think that's reasonable. I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, so let's do this then. We will um, we'll take a motion to approve sending a letter <laughs> sort of as as amended on the floor here, even though we're not driving the particular language right now. Um, I will, um, I'll iterate the letter. We'll add it to the, we'll add the final version to the packet that gets posted. And um, we can have everybody maybe stop by the office and sign sometime over the next day or two. Yep. Does that that'd work? Be great. That'd be great. Okay. Anyone who can make a call or two to, to advocate that can also go along and help yeah. too, and I'll do the same. That's what I was going to say is the alternative is we sort of, on the basis of the discussion, we could each independently, you know, each independently reach out. It doesn't have to be a committee, doesn't have to be a committee letter on letterhead per se, but. Mm -hmm. um, both, the power of yeah, both. Yeah, there's no, mm -hmm. they're not mutually exclusive, so. Okay, um, so can we take an attempt at that motion? Uh, um, so I move to submit a letter to our delegation, our state delegation, for asking for further review um, to our keys to literacy request of forty thousand dollars. Yeah, and thanking them for what they've done so far. Yeah, we won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair. We'll yeah. take it. Um, second. Is there a second? Okay. Carla and Chuck, any further discussion? Sarah, anything on your end? No. Okay. Um, all right, so with that, we'll take a vote. Sarah? Aye. Chuck? Aye. Tom? Aye. Carla? Aye. And Sean? Aye. Everyone? All right, seven minutes ahead of schedule. Is there a final motion? <laughs> Move to adjourn. Second. Seconded, uh, moved to adjourn by Carla, seconded by Tom. Um, Sarah. Aye. Chuck. Aye. Um, Tom. Aye. Carla. Aye. And Sean, aye. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone.